Africa service of Vatican Radio. Welcome to our half-hour daily program for Africa. In today's program, you can hear our feature culture and society and news for young people. First, however, our bulletin of church news. I am Festus Tarawali. Pope Francis said on Thursday there are Christians who are afraid of the joy of Christ's resurrection and who instead prefer sadness and staying in the shadows just like bats. The importance of Christians being joyful rather than sad or fearful was the focus of the Pope's reflections during his homily at the morning mass he celebrated in the Santa Marta residence. Susie Hodges reports. Taking his cue from the gospel reading of the risen Christ appearing before his disciples, Pope Francis noted how instead of rejoicing over his resurrection, the disciples were struck by fear instead. He said this fear is a Christian disease because we're afraid of being close to Jesus and that's why there's so many Christians whose lives seem to be a perpetual funeral. Those who prefer sadness to carry. The Pope said, using a little sense of humor, we can say that there are bat-like Christians who prefer the shadows to the joy and the light of our Lord's presence. He concluded his homily by underlining the need for every Christian to have a dialogue with Jesus. A Christian life should be this, he said, because Jesus is always with us and accompanies us in both good and bad times. Let the Lord open our minds, just as he did for the disciples, who were afraid of joy after Christ's resurrection. I'm Susie Hodges. Pope Francis on Thursday met with the first group of bishops from South Africa who are in Rome for their ad limina visit. The members of the South and African Catholic Bishops Conference, which consists of all the bishops of South Africa, Botswana and Swaziland, are presently in Rome for their five yearly visit to the Holy Father and the Roman Courier. The conference is currently headed by Most Reverend Stephen Brislin, Archbishop of Cape Town, South Africa. Also on Thursday morning, Pope Francis received in audience the Prime Minister of the Republic of Albania, His Excellency Eddie Rama. The Prime Minister later went on to meet with the Cardinal Secretary of State Pietro Parolin, accompanied by Archbishop Dominique Mamberti, Secretary for Relations with States. During the cordial discussions, the parties remarked upon the good relations between the Holy See and the Republic of Albania, said a statement from the press office of the Holy See. The discussions also focused on themes of common interest regarding the relations between the ecclesial and civil communities, including interreligious dialogue and the contribution of the church to the common good of Albanian society. The statement said important regional issues were also discussed, including Albania's progress towards full integration within the European Union. In a tweet on Thursday, Pope Francis returned to the theme of simplicity. Through the handle at Pontifex, he wrote, A simple lifestyle is good for us, helping us to better share with those in need. The church in Africa is paying tribute to the two popes who will be elevated to sainthood this weekend with a two-day conference that opened in Rome on Thursday. The church in Africa from Vatican II to the third millennium, Africa's homage to Popes John the Twenty Third and John Paul the Second is the theme of the meeting which has brought together bishops, priests, theologians, scholars and eminent figures in African culture. The initiative taking place at the Pontifical Urbaniana University has been organized by the Symposium of Episcopal Conferences of Africa and Madagascar, SECAM, in partnership with many religious institutes. It is promoted by the Pontifical Council for Culture and the Cardinal Bernardine Gantin Center. One of the speakers at the conference on Thursday morning was Nigerian professor of theology, John Ebulefu, who personally knew Pope John Paul II. I lived the experience of his fatherly goodness from close range. You can never, never have come in contact with this man and felt bad. That was um, an aura in him, a magnetizing aura. You feel you are in the sphere of goodness. And in fact, 
much infectious goodness that you yourself go about. Goodness there is consciously or unconsciously avoiding things that are evil. So it is from there every other thing follows that he was doing. I say every other thing he was doing was good because the man was good. He spoke well. He talked well. He did everything well because he was good. And that's what fascinated me that time, Kadmi Harasinga, who brought me to him. And then, lucky for me, his secretary, Jivish, took me to close heart so that I was frequently in that apartment and got to know the man from closest range. I was calling him grandfather. That was Reverend Professor John Egbulefu, the founder of Christ the Emmanuel Congregation. The Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue released a message on Thursday addressed to Buddhists as they prepare to mark the Feast of Vesak, which recalls the enlightenment of Prince Siddhartha Gautama, founder of the religion. The Festival of Lights, as Vesak is also known, is celebrated in May each year. Philippa Hitchin has more. The theme of the message is Buddhists and Christians together fostering freedom. General Jean-Louis Torrent writes, As Buddhists and Christians, we live in a world all too often torn apart by selfishness, tribalism, ethnic rivalry, violence, and religious fundamentalism. A world where the other is treated as an inferior, a non-person, or someone to be feared and eliminated if possible. Cardinal Torrent goes on, Yet we are called in a spirit of cooperation with other people pilgrims and people of goodwill to respect and to defend our shared humanity in a variety of socio-economic, political and religious contexts. The full official English text of the message is available on our Vatican Radio website at rv.va, clicking on the English world icon. I'm Philippa Hitchin. You're tuned to the Africa service of Vatican Radio. The government of South East Sudan has withdrawn the case against four of the remaining political prisoners who were detained last December on grounds that they had planned to overthrow the government. They had been charged with treason. They are Pagani Amum, the former Secretary General of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, ex National Security Minister Riyai Deng Ajak, former Defense Minister Mazaka Diagot, and former Ambassador to the United States, Ezekiel Loro Gatkos. The release was a key demand of the rebels loyal to Riek Machal, and the government of South East Sudan has been under pressure from different countries to set them free in order to facilitate peace in the country. South East Sudanese Minister for Justice Paulino Wanawila said on Sunday that the case against the four was dropped in the interest of peace and reconciliation. He said they would be released by Friday. The charges against the four carried a death sentence. The decision to release them came after the United Nations Security Council threatened on Wednesday to impose sanctions against anybody who is frustrating the peace efforts. The peace talks, which had been scheduled to resume in Addis Ababa this week, were postponed due to disagreements between the government and the rebel delegations. On Thursday, the government of Mali charged the former coup leader, General Amado Sanogo, with the conspiracy to murder, which carries the death penalty. Sanogo was arrested and charged with the complicity in a kidnapping in November last year over the disappearance of paratroopers loyal to President Amado Tomani Ture, who was overthrown in 2012. Investigators said in recent months they discovered mass graves around the headquarters of the former military government, which prompted the government to change the charges against Sanogo to a more serious one. The case against Sanogo and several others is part of efforts by President Ibrahim Bubaka Keita to assert civilian control over the Malian army, which has been accused by human rights groups of excessive violence and torture during the short-lived military government. 
and lastly medical sources in the guinea conakry have said the number of people infected with the ebola fever continues to rise in the country the disease surfaced in west africa in february this year and has killed 142 people in guinea conakry alone medical doctors said on wednesday in the capital conakry that there are hundreds of people who have shown signs of the disease but have not yet received the treatment Ebola is caused by a virus and is spread from one person to another by contact with the bodily fluids of infected people or animals its symptoms include vomiting bleeding and organ failure you are tuned to the english africa service of vatican radio <laughs> And society and a welcome to the program. In this edition today, we focus on the World Food Program, the UAP, that has increased its food distribution in Central African Republic. We also take a closer look at the situation on the ground in South Sudan, where fighting goes on despite the international community's efforts to stop it. My name is Kanyanta Godfrey Kampamba. The World Food Program, WFP, has scaled up food distribution to more than one million people in the Central African Republic. The United Nations Food Agency has made an urgent appeal for 107 million United States dollars to support its work that should last until August 2014. In spite of the ongoing conflict in the country, WFP and its partners have reached more than 230,000 displaced people in the past weeks, including in the capital Bangi and the northwestern city of Bosangoa. United Nations Radio Star with Maigua in Geneva spoke with agency spokesperson Elizabeth Bowles about WFP's operations in the Central African Republic. In cars, security is now the biggest challenge. So the situation is still volatile, it's insecure, and that's why WFP is using mobile teams in order to do the distribution and reach as many people as possible, those people who are in need of food. So the security situation remains a big challenge. How is your distribution of relief assistance to those who are in need going? So far, we are scaling up our operation to assist 1.2 million people in the next eight months as we can see that growing numbers of people are going hungry. And WFP is scaling up its operation. We also urge all parties to the conflict to ensure the safe access by humanitarian personnel. WFP is neutral and is delivering assistance on the basis of need. Since the 5th of December, WFP assisted over 237,000 people. We need to scale up even more. In total, WFP has provided food to over 174,000 people in Bangui, over 41,000 people in Bosangoa, and over 21,000 people in Buar. So WFP is doing its best to distribute food to those people. Conflict has driven more than half a million people out of homes, and we distribute in 34 sites in Central African Republic. What is the situation of the people you're distributing food to? Are you seeing increased cases of malnutrition, especially among the vulnerable, such as children? Yes, we can see that more and more people are food insecure. An assessment done in October already showed that over 30% of households are food insecure, and 30% of households is 1.3 million people would need food assistance. That's why WFP is scaling up its operation to assist 1.2 million. There is a lot of insecurity. How are you able to reach those who need food in some of the most affected areas, especially in Bongi and Basangoa? We try to use mobile teams in order to be more flexible 
and the teams are moving swiftly from side to side and we are also able to adjust plans to avoid putting people in need of assistance at risk and we conduct a protection analysis in each place. In some locations also companies may be provided to help protect women and children. We had to stop the distribution at the airport because the situation was very bad but we are discussing to resume the distribution as soon as possible. WFP had appealed for about $107 million to provide assistance in the Central African Republic. Have donors been generous enough? So far, we need support from donors. We appealed for $107 million to go until August 2004 and to assist those people. We urgently need support from donors so we can go on with the distribution and we hope not to be running out of food. That's why this money is badly needed, not to break the pipeline. So we really call on all donors to support our effort because those people are in need of assistance and WSP is doing his best. Fighting campaigns in South Sudan, the conflict that broke out in mid-December has so far left thousands of people displaced. A confrontation between soldiers loyal to President Salva Kiir and those supporting former Vice President Riek Macha, who was sacked in July, is what triggered off the crisis. Over 1,000 people are estimated to have died in the violence in a country that is struggling to stand on its feet since it became independent from Sudan in 2011. United Nations Radio's Derek Mbata spoke by phone with a spokesperson for the United Nations mission in South Sudan on Miss Joseph Contreras to find out more about the situation in the country. The fighting has unfortunately not stopped in South Sudan since the government of President Salva Kiir Meyer D and former Vice President Riek Machar Tani agreed to open exploratory talks in the Ethiopian capital of Ababa. What about casualties? Do you have the number of casualties in this fighting, the latest? Well, we have been unable to independently confirm that figure, but we think that's a plausible estimate. Estimates that go higher than that, we would treat with caution at this point. So what about the humanitarian situation? How many people have been affected by this conflict now? Well, so far, according to the UN Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, 100 194,000 civilians have been uprooted by the violence since the 15th of December. Of that figure, 57,500 people have sought refuge in 13 installations of the UN peacekeeping mission in South Sudan nationwide. 107,000 displaced people out of that overall figure of 194,000 have received some form of humanitarian assistance to date. Now, the head of UNMIS, uh, Hilda Johnson, has uh, strongly condemned the atrocities she says are uh, being committed by both sides in this conflict. What what are the atrocities that she is referring to? What is happening? Well, we've been receiving evidence and eyewitness testimony of extrajudicial killings that have taken place, rapes, arbitrary detention, and other similar abuses. Our human rights officers are working around the clock in various parts of the country where the worst of the fighting has taken place to try to gather more information on these reports of atrocities and document the allegations. We don't have yet an estimate on how many atrocities have taken place since the crisis broke out on the 15th of December. Now it has been said that uh, this conflict is between the Nua and Dinka. Is this a correct characterization of the crisis? We don't consider it to be a correct view of what has unfolded here. The UN mission in views this as essentially a political conflict of service for power to control the ruling party, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement. Tensions have been growing between President Kiir and his former vice president for months on end. And we also note that the composition of the government and its 
cabinet ministers as well as that of the inner circle of the vice presidents come from multiple ethnic origins. So for that reason and others, we don't regard it as an ethnic conflict. Now, finally, what is Amnis doing to try to help end this crisis? Well, the head of the mission, Hilda F. Johnson, has been in constant contact with key leaders of South Sudan since the beginning of the crisis. She has met with President Kiir. She has been in phone contact with the former Vice President, Riek Tsarateni, and the mission has repeatedly called on all parties to the crisis to refrain from further violence, to open talks that will lead to a peaceful end of this crisis. That was on Mrs. Spokesperson Joseph Contreras giving us a picture of the situation in South Sudan. Earlier we said about WFP's operations in the Central African Republic where it has scaled up its food distribution. And that is all for today for me, and the Godfrey Kampamba. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the program. I am Festus Tarawali. The Diocese of Rome is sponsoring an all-night vigil on Saturday in 11 churches around the center of Rome for the canonization of Pope John XXIII and Pope John Paul II. Young people of the Catholic Action Movement from all over Italy and other countries will gather at the parish of Santa Maria delle Grazie in Rome for their own all-night prayer and reflection. After the prayer vigil expected to end in the early hours of Sunday, participants will proceed to St. Peter's Square for the canonization to be presided over by Pope Francis. Meanwhile, young people who are in Rome for the elevation to sainthood of John Paul II and Pope John XXIII are encouraged to visit the San Lorenzo Center, a small international youth center located just a few meters from St. Peter's Square. The San Lorenzo Center is the permanent home of the World Youth Day Cross and one of the lasting legacies of Pope John Paul II, the founder of World Youth Day. Since Tuesday this week until Friday, the center is offering the opportunity for mass, confession, adoration, and a chance to meet other young people from around the world. And as we look forward to the canonization of John Paul II, the man who has inspired so many young people around the world, let us listen to this call he made to young people to be conscious of their role in church and society. people. Young men and women, tonight I want to repeat what I keep telling you. You are the future of the world and the day of tomorrow belongs to you. Everywhere Young people are asking important questions. Questions on the meaning of life, on the right way to live, on the true scale of values. What 
must I do? What must I do to share in everlasting life? This questioning bears witness to your thoughts, your consciences, your hands, your words. This questioning tells the work that you young people carry within yourself a special openness with regard to what is good and what is true. That was the soon-to-be-canonized Pope John Paul II. And that's all for this edition. Till the same time next week, I am Festus Tarawali, and you are tuned to the Africa service of Vatican Radio. Praise be Jesus Christ. Now dead to Jesus Christus. <laughs> Thank you.